in your patience with me. So we're going to talk about the verdicts of hell. And basically, can the gates of hell prevail against the church? And I spent years chewing on how can stationary gates prevail? Prevail means conquer, overcome. And I came up with yes. And again, back to Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed. They perished by lack of knowledge. They've, lo they've lost the knowing of the Holy One. They've lost the memory. Because you reject knowledge, I will also reject you. Seeing that you've forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. The judgment of God on Israel was take away spiritual understanding in their hearts and minds. That they won't remember. Remembering is critical for us as a people to continue to move forward in God. We have to impart it into the next generation. We have to impart the miracles, the miraculous. We have to tell the stories of the miraculous. The, um, now, one of the truths we have to have clearly established is the evil one is under the is controlling nations. The evil one controls the systems of government. First John 5, 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world, all the ethnos, those are all the tribes, all the different ethnic groups are under the power of the evil one. Under the power means they're subjected, the, the nations are under the subjection of the kingdom of darkness. They're under the control, the dominion, and the rule of an even sovereign. It also means they're under the government of the kingdom of darkness. They're under the laws of the courts of darkness. So the government of hell establishes a shadow government, literally, which is controlling world system and systems, the governments, the courts, the executive, the legislative, works, through business, finance, church, media, education, arts, the seven mountains are controlled by the government of hell. Even the church is controlled by the government of hell, especially those parts of the church that have decided not to believe, not to, re not to believe in the wonder of God, not to remember, to reject the miraculous. So an end time Revelation is this understanding comes out of. In Daniel 12, 4, it says, But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. The knowledge of mankind has truly increased, but not the knowledge of God and the nations. And Daniel had a revelation of the courts of heaven. He understood God. Now, Revelation 10, 4, this was an angel speaking. I was going to write what I heard, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. John was standing in Patmos, and he saw an angel standing, and, and his feet were one on the land. Land always symbolizes Israel. The other was in the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. sea represents the nation. And the seven thunders that John heard, he wanted to write down, but he was told not to write them down because the Lord was going to seal it up. And that's what he has done. He has sealed it up. But at this point in time, we know that the books are being opened. So out of that, God is releasing the wisdom and the strategy, which is available to the prophets and to the mature sons of God. And this revelation of the courts of heaven for me came when I was in India. When I was in India, I had a situation where we were invited to teach the, um, to a family. And the family was this wife who was separated for, legally separated from her husband for 10 years. Now, every Friday night, the pastor that we were staying with would go with his family and they would do worship, and then they would bring a word, and they would encourage this family. Now, the wife showed up, and she was dressed to the nines. She was bedecked in jewels. 
she, her makeup was perfect. Her dress was one of the most beautiful that I saw in anyone in India. And she came in and literally she held court. Now, what she had done after her separation from her husband, she had married a Hindu man and became his second wife. So as we're doing the worship, I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, what is going on here? And I'm feeling the pain of the two daughters. Now, in their culture, as in many other cultures, it's an honor culture. And to have a mother who is married to another man, who is not divorced, brings great shame on the daughters. And the daughters' lives were ruined, literally, where they would never marry. So during worship, I'm feeling it all. So after worship, our pastor friend asked me to bring the word, and I said, I can't. All I can feel is the pain of these girls. So I took them into another room and I ministered to them. They were so angry at God. They'd been standing for 10 years for this mother to be restored to the family. And when I went out into the living room where she was sitting with the pastor's wife, she immediately began to justify her behavior. You have no idea how I have suffered with when I was married to this man. He was a banker. He wasn't poor. And he um, basically, in all of this, she started telling me her relationship with Jesus was just perfect. Now, when someone tells you the relationship with Jesus is good, you really cannot come back and say, well, it wouldn't be good in my eyes because of A, B, C. You're in adultery. You're destroying your children's lives. How can you say that Jesus is okay with all this? So that night when I went home, I began to do a real um, wrestling with God. When I don't understand something, and I just don't understand how can this be true, um, I went through a divorce, and I know my husband justified everything. I was like, how can this be, that they feel righteous in their decision? And the Lord began speaking to me about the gates of hell and what it really meant. And see, the gates were, in our minds, our stationary objects. But in the Old Testament, the gate was where the government was, and the elders sat. This is where they held court. So it's basically the Lord is telling us, he's given us the keys of the kingdom. And then he tells us, and in in this rock you're standing on, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and I'm giving you these keys. And what you open is open, and what you close is closed. And based on these keys, you're going to the, the gates of hell, the government of hell, the court of hell will not prevail against the church. But it's on the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's on the youth, correct use of the keys of binding and loosening. So when I, he began speaking to me, and he said, she went to the court of hell. And she got a verdict. She got a judgment on her behalf, justifying her behavior. And on the basis of that justification, she is able to do what she's doing in total self-righteousness. This self-righteousness is what we see in cases where the verdicts of hell are in operation. So... So the keys of the kingdom, Matthew 18, 18 through 20, whatever, whatever means all things, whatever you bind on earth, bind there is dio. It means put under an obligation, forbid, declare to be illicit, whatever is done to fulfill a legal requirement. So whatever you bind, this is a legal term, is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, these are laws that have binding force. Anything we declare unlawful, we can destroy, we can dissolve, we can dismiss, will be dismissed and loosed in heaven. These are the kingdom, keys of the kingdom. These keys of the kingdom basically are saying we have legal authority over the court of hell.
So we've got the keys of the kingdom. And these are the responsibilities of the mature sons of God to co-labor with the courts of heaven, to establish justice and righteousness for individuals, cities, churches, and nations. It's the duty to bring the testimony of prophecy. Remember, remember the time of Hezekiah. He laid out his argument before the Lord as he travailed on behalf of his people to obtain a righteous judgment from the courts of heaven. We have the authority to request the just judge to overturn the verdicts of hell with all of the regulations and instructions being rescinded and to decree righteous judgments. Now, what's a judgment? It's an authoritative decision given by a judge or a court. And many times there's an obligation that's going to arise from this decision. So the obligation would be the liability that we talked about early. The truth will set you free. It's free from the liability. And the verdict says it is true. So anytime there's a verdict, a verdict of heaven or a verdict of hell, it's saying it is true. It's a finding, it's a ruling, it's a sentence. There are righteous judgments. So the judgments of the Lord, Psalm 19.9, are true and righteous altogether. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are all your judgments. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. Now, if there are righteous judgments, because we know that the enemy imitates everything in the kingdom of God, there are, we can assume, we can make, infer that there are unrighteous judgments. And these would be the verdicts of hell. Sin and iniquity allow the judgments to be imposed by the court of hell. And what's the purpose? To rob, steal, destroy the destiny of individual cities, regions, nations, and the body of Christ. Now, there's also contracts that are made. These are the trading floors. And these are written or spoken agreements enforceable by law. So when two or more come into agreement, it becomes a contract. It becomes a trading floor. So putting this back into the age of enlightenment, the age of science, the age of reason, when they began to look at anthropology and they began to make the determination, they all came into agreement regarding the races and the inferiority of the black race, which allowed them to enslave them and to do all forms of wickedness. But it became a covenant. It became a bargain. It gave them the right to indenture them. It gave them the right to hold them in slavery. Now, we have the responsibility to nullify these contracts of darkness, these covenants of darkness, these agreements with hell, which became law. Remember, this woman came into agreement, probably with her lover, that her husband was wicked. And because he was a wicked, he was, he, she had suffered so, she was righteous. And that's where it comes in, where it says, where any two touch in agreement, it is established. It doesn't say where any two righteous people touch in agreement. It's any agreement, which is why God had to confuse the tongues at the Tower of Babel. So we have to nullify these contracts of darkness that are over cities, regions, churches, ethnic groups, nations, blood, DNA. And these contracts of darkness have been made by righteous, religious and civil authorities. Those popes with their edicts, giving them the right to enslave the people, they were just as much involved in an edict of hell, a verdict of hell. In fact, those were edicts coming right out of hell. So there is an evil council that operates with the spiritual law of agreement. These are evil men when they gather together and they plan and they scheme and hell enlightens them on how to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And when this happens, it gives the government of hell the right to rule the people, to oppress the people, to enslave the people. And if people break that contract of hell, they will suffer punishment for the breach of contract. So we've got kingdoms at war. We've got ruler, almighty God versus Satan. We've got the court system. If there's the courts of heaven, we can infer the courts of hell. And we can, we're presenting cases. If sons of God have authority in the courts of heaven, we can infer that the seed of Satan has authority in the courts of hell. It's all a war 
over which government is ruling and reigning in our lives, in our nation, in our people groups. Okay, so basically, I hope you can see there are verdicts that were established in order to bring people under slavery. There were verdicts of hell. These verdicts of hell then control and establish the relationships between people within a nation, the relationship between the races. And these verdicts are going to need to be overturned. The way we overturn verdicts is first, we're going to have to do great repentance. And then second, we have to really, really go into the, um, the scriptures that we will prevent, present as evidence to overturn the verdict. Because when you overturn a verdict of hell, you have to have what the word of God says, which is the true verdict, the true judgments, the righteous judgments of God. We always have to establish in its place a righteous judgment. So I'm going to leave now and we're going to go to the other Zoom room. Thank you.